koalas. There's been a lot of breeding going on between the two, but today we're principally going to be talking about hooperas. If you have any questions, please feel free to send them through. We can discuss the questions as we are going. We're going to be talking about hookeras for this area, for Southwest and for pretty much the Midwest, um, all over our region. There are a lot of good varieties. There's been a lot of good breeding going on with hookeras, but there are also some bums out there. So we're going to be talking about the ones that are really going to work in gardens in this area. A lot of different varieties and options uh, out there as far as what you can actually use. A lot of colors, a lot of sizes, textures, a lot of flowering varieties. So we're going to go over some really nice attributes to all of the different ones that are on the market. It's one of the most adaptable perennials for in the garden as far as color and texture, especially in shade gardens. It adds a lot. There are a lot of nice colors and unique patterns that you can add. Hookeras are deer resistant, but they are not deer proof. Uh, so there are very few perennials that are deer proof, but this is one of the plants that they, if they get desperate, they will go after, but for the most part, they oh, will okay. be alone. So now I'm unmuted. Things for hookeras is they make excellent container plants. There are a lot of things that you can do with them as far as in mixed containers. There are certain varieties that are going to work better in mixed containers than others. Uh, mixed containers usually give a really nice growing condition for the plants. So the drainage is, soil drainage is really good. The amount of light can be adjusted by moving them around. It's a lot easier to deal with cucras in containers than it is in the ground. <clears throat> Some of the big problems that we run into with hookeras is not having them properly sited, having them in a place where they're not going to perform to their most optimum ability, having too wet of soil, too dry of soil, too much sun, too much shade. So it is very critical to get them into the right growing conditions. A lot of times it can be lead to injuries over time. You will see damage done to the plants from being in the wrong area. Otherwise, they do give you really good texture, color, form, and work really well with a lot of plants. A lot of colors have been coming onto the market, so we're always looking at new varieties that are coming out. The big breeders, the, the who's who of where the coral bells are coming from. In our talk today, we are going to be looking at a few different breeders that are out there. Walters Gardens, Proven Winners, and Terra Nova are the big marketers and breeders that are out. They're the ones who are doing all the research and all of the development of a lot of the new varieties that we have out on the market. U.S. plant patents. Let's talk a little bit about U.S. plant patents. The Plant Patent Office in Washington, D.C. will basically patent anything. As long as you fill out the paperwork and pay the fees, they will patent anything. You can have the patent. Once you have applied for it, it belongs to you. With plant patents, they apply only to cultivated varieties. So you can't dig something up out in the woods and have it patented. It has to be a variety that you have developed. It has to be something that is different from some uh, plant growing in its native state. When we are dealing with this, we are dealing with plants as far as what the breeders are doing. They do their own trials for about three years. So they will actually develop the plant and then put it into trials here in the United States throughout the area for about three years to see what that plant is actually going to do. Once they have done that trial, then they send the plants around the world to do trials for another two years. And it's usually in like environments or like climates. They're not going to send a plant that's being bred in Michigan to Tahiti, where it's going to be hot and sweltering conditions or tropical conditions. So they're looking for places that have the same temperate climates that these plants are going to be growing in. 
So once you fill out the application, it goes to Washington and disappears into a pile of papers for two years. So in that time, all of the information is being taken care of. Once you have filed for that patent and have paid the fees, you are protected. So the plant is under patent at that time. So once you stick an envelope, a stamp on the envelope, it's there. The plant patent, once it has been applied for, is good for 20 years. This that I am holding right here is a plant patent. This is a real plant patent. This is for obsidian coral bell. So that's what a plant patent is. People in our business, we always talk about the plant police. There's no such thing. We're the plant police. We are the ones who have to watch for this. So once you own this patent, it is up to you to protect it. To protect the average plant patent, it's gonna probably cost you about $100,000 in legal fees. If somebody is stealing cuttings or marketing that plant in a way that you do not agree with, or they're not paying you the royalties, it is up to you and your lawyer to find that person and pursue them. So a plant patent is only a document. It is only a legal document. It is up to you to enforce it. I know when I first started in this business, we were always looking for that million dollar plant. Unfortunately, once we find force a patent. Plant patents are very difficult to enforce. That's why the big places, the big breeders like Terra Nova and Walters Gardens have the money to be able to enforce those patents. The plants that we are mostly dealing with are Native American plants. These are all the hookahs that we are being, going to be talking about are native plants. There's a lot of breeding with our native coral bells that is going into this. Pictured here is Heuchera americana. This is one of our native coral bells that you find here growing in the woods occasionally. This has been, has been used a lot in the breeding on the coral bells. This particular one, americana, is where we're getting that silver overlay that you see on a lot of the coral bells. They have that nice silvery sheen. That's where a lot of americana comes from. There is Heuchera cylindrica. You can see it has a smoother leaf to it. Heuchera cylindrica is a native of the Northwest United States, Pacific Northwest, but it also goes all the way over into including Montana and Wyoming. So when we hear things in the Pacific Northwest, you know they have those really temperate climates there. You're, when you get into the interior away from the coast, that's when you get into the really hot, dry areas, the really cold, wet areas. So Heuchera cylindrica does really well and can adapt to our climate very nicely too. Heuchera micrantha is another one that we're seeing a lot of breeding being done with. Micrantha is native to the Northwest as well, including Idaho. So it is in, in those rugged mountainous areas where it can go very dry for extended times or extremely cold for prolonged times and works out really nicely. Heuchera sanguinea is one that we're looking at for a lot of the flower colors that are coming out on heucheras. There's a lot more breeding. Heucheras, for the most part, have always been treated as foliage plants, but we're seeing a lot more going on with flowers now. So we're breeding some new varieties that are going to have good flower colors. Sanguinea is native to Arizona, New Mexico. Again, very tough areas. Not all of Arizona is desert. Not all of New Mexico is desert. They still have some temperate areas, but they can get really hot temperatures, really dry conditions, um, as well as cold in the winter time. So this is a really good one that has got that good, strong breeding for the flower color. Heuchera velosa is probably our number one plant that we're using for breeding right now in the wild. This is our native wild weed coral bell. You will find this in the woods around here. This particular variety, velosa, is what is being used for a lot of the leaf size. So with Heuchera velosa, you're getting those really large leaves. It adapts to our very dry shade around here very nicely. When we're talking about shade plants in 
the Midwest, we're usually talking about extremely dry shade because the trees around there are taking so much moisture out of the ground. With Hucra villosa, it is adapted to those dry conditions, but produces those really nice large leaves. So how do we start them? When we start our coral bells, we start them from plugs, where, which you can see there to the right. We can either propagate those, we can do them from cuttings, or in most cases where these plants have been licensed, they have to come in in plug form. So we can propagate when we can by law and we pay the royalties on those. Otherwise we buy in the plugs and grow them on from there. It takes a few months to produce a marketable plant. So we start them small and then have them ready at the appropriate time. In this particular case, these plants were planted on August 7th and we're shooting for 10-1. So about two months to have a decent plant that's ready to go. So after two months of being in this area with a little bit of shade, they're gonna fl flourish and take off. In a spring crop, these particular ones were planted in, earlier in the season uh, in June and we're shooting for the first of August for those or mid-August for those to be ready. Here's where we are by August 1st. So they've got some nice flush to them. It takes a couple of months to get them rooted out completely in a pot to be a nice marketable plant. Good roots means a good growing plant. So having that root system on there is critical. For the care of hookahs, we always leave the tops on our plants. Through Never the mind, winter. David. We do not like to cut the, this foliage through the winter months. We try to leave that foliage there as a natural mulch. It actually protects the crowns of the plant. I never recommend cutting all of that foliage off through the winter months because it can lead to damage on down the line as the plants are exposed to the cold. This is what they look like going into spring. They're pretty rough looking, pretty nasty. When you have an individual plant, you've got that old tattered foliage. What we do is we clean off all of that, the old flowers and the old foliage. Look at what's underneath a nice new plant starting to emerge. That new foliage is gonna flush out. Mm -hmm. So getting rid of that and cleaning it up, it's gonna give it a really nice clean look. Over time, coral bells can get quite large. Um, they can, going through and dividing them periodically works out really well. We recommend probably after about five years is usually a good time to start dividing and cleaning them up. Otherwise they start getting very woody towards the center. You see they form these long shoots. Cutting those shoots off will kill that part of the plant. So you want to leave those on there. We recommend not cutting the leaves back or even cutting into these, these fingers that they form. You can see once you dig them out of the ground, this is the stage that you want to start separating them at. Cutting those little almost tuber-like structures apart and making sure that you have good roots on there is going to be critical. Don't go too small if you are going to be doing dividing on them because you can damage the plants. The best time to divide hookahs is in the spring months. There are some diseases and some problems that you can wind up with on hookahs. Powdery mildew can be a problem. Here in Ohio, that's whenever we get hot and humid or cool and humid, which is pre pretty much just about any time. So you can have powdery mildew, which is this gray fungus that grows on the leaves. Rust can be a problem when we have really wet springs. Rust are these dimples or stipples that you see on the undersides of the leaves and on the tops of the leaves. Again, a fungicide, a systemic fungicide will take care of that. Botrytis can be a problem as well. So anytime that you're seeing any conditions like this on your plants, it's always a great idea to take a sample and take it to a garden center or contact the county extension and they will be able to tell you what is happening with that plant at that time. So anytime you're seeing these kinds of conditions, those are things to be watching for. A lot of the breeding that's going into coral bells though right now, that's what they're looking at is the disease resistance and getting these plants to take off and flourish and have nice, strong, healthy breeding. 
They can disappear. Pat, we got a question in the yes. Pat, we got a question in the chat. Sure. Um, not all well versed in diseases. What did you just say? Uh, let me go back. On the diseases, we're talking about powdery mildew, which is a fungus on the leaves. I'm sorry, just the last one. I got the first two, but not the last one. And I will unmute. The last one is botrytis. One. botrytis. Say it again, I'm sorry. Botrytis. Um, botrytis is also a fungus. It's the same thing if you've ever had peonies where the flower buds turn black and they never develop. That's botrytis too. It's usually good to start hitting that with a systemic fungicide. I would say any time now, as soon as the active growth starts coming out, botrytis is usually when you have that showing up. When we have really wet conditions, uh, wet springs, that's usually when you see that condition. It almost has a bruised look to the leaf. So that's a good time to start treating that. I don't have any particular fungicide that I recommend. Like I say, any garden center should be able to recommend something for you that's going to work. When hookeras disappear, there's usually something involved with it. It's not always that it's a bad plant. In some cases, it's the growing conditions that that plant was subjected to. It may have been really wet. It may have been really dry. It may have been too much sun. Um, it may have been complete shade without any sun. So there are some varying reasons why they will disappear over time. Usually when they go into decline, you'll notice a gradual shrinking of them. They were nice and big last year. Now I've got only about 10 leaves. Next year, there's only gonna be about two or three leaves, followed by them completely disappearing. So the growing conditions for them are critical. And if you're noticing anything where you're noticing any kind of decline like this without any fungus problems or anything showing up in the leaves, then it may be something to do with where they are sited. So you are going to have to take a look at that as you are growing these particular plants. As far as who we grow for, we, this is one of the best things that we have to be able to gauge by what we are growing hookahs, what varieties we are growing, and what works best. We grow for a very big spectrum of different people. We grow for garden centers and retailers, landscapers and hole diggers, cities and municipalities, and avid gardeners and plant enthusiasts. So we are de dealing with people who are highly skilled in growing plants, as well as beginners, people who don't know that much about plants. So the varieties that we're producing are ones that we know are going to work for a lot of different situations and a lot of people. Landscapers are a big segment of our business and they know which varieties they can plant on a job site and are going to be reliable, that are going to work for them very nicely. Cities and municipalities, we deal with cities as large as the city of Cincinnati, which has an army for a workforce, as well as volunteers, to very small villages and towns where the guy who takes care of and maintains the flower beds is the same guy that scrapes up the dead animals. So it's going to be varied as far as who takes care of what and what kind of uh, plants are going to work really nicely for them. Now we're actually going to take a look at the, one, the varieties that we feel are the best ones out there. Starting with Berry Timeless. Berry Timeless is from Walters Gardens. This is a Velosa variety. It is a Velosa bred plant. This particular one was bred for the flowers. Interestingly enough, with Berry Timeless, it, the name Timeless comes from the fact that the flowers are almost everlasting. They're very similar to Status. If you've ever grown Status as a dried flower, the flower color actually starts as red and then fades to a light pink on this particular plant. So it has that nice multicolor effect. Those flowers will stay on there very long into the season, and Berry Timeless does produce flowers throughout the season. So it is a really nice one for the flowers as well as the foliage. The foliage has that nice silvery overlay. When we're looking at all of these plants that have that silver variegation to them, they are going to require some shade for that. 
morning sun, morning sun, afternoon shade is best. If they get too much sun, then you're going to notice some scorching on there, which we'll be taking a look at a little bit later. Black Pearl. Everybody knows Black Pearl right now. It's one of the Proven Winner varieties. It's part of the Proven Winners Primo series. And the Proven Winner Hookeras, there are the Primos and the Dulces. The Primos are the big ones. These are going to get enormous. They have really huge presence to them. Black Pearl is a really nice one because it maintains this really dark, almost black color throughout the season. And you can see in that little inset there at the bottom, the flower, the leaf size, they're about four, five, six inches wide. This is a really nice big variety, so it does require some room. Again, with the Primo series, there are several we'll be talking about. They're the really large ones, so they're gonna need some room to be able to perform really nicely. You have that nice, dark, shiny foliage on them throughout the season. Another one that's really nice in the darker color is black taffeta. Black taffeta is a combination between chocolate ruffles and midnight ruffles. Those were the two parents. So with black taffeta, you've got that nice ruffly foliage. It has a really nice presence too. It has this nice black in the spring. And later into the fall, it turns to a nice red color. I use a lot of black taffeta, especially in the fall, because this is a really good plant for in mixed containers and window boxes as a cabbage substitute. A lot of people use cabbage and kale in the fall. When we get down into the teens and the single digits, cabbages and kales tend to turn into sauerkraut. This particular one will hold up through the winter. So it holds really nicely and gives you some presence all winter long. It has that nice evergreen foliage and that little bit of a sort of a chocolatey purple through the winter months. Pat, we got a couple questions here. Okay. Um, one is I had five plants in the same area light shaded with on slope. Uh, four of them were reddish maroon and one was lime green. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what the names were when planted about five years ago. The lime chartreuse has disappeared. Mm -hmm. Without the names, can the speaker comment? I would have to see what the particular leaf is. We might be able to identify it possibly from a leaf. If you could send email a leaf or get a picture of it and send it to us, we may be able to identify from that. The lime greens we'll get to, they have some problems and we'll be taking a look at that. But um, lime green can be tough as far as the variety that you're actually growing. There are some really nice varieties out there, but there are also some that are not so good. And then we have another question is, what is the variety on slide 38? I don't know what slide 38. I don't know what slide 30, <laughs> yeah. If you could, the one who asked the question on the slide, if you could let us know what, what the color was, if it was one of the dark leafed or if it was a red, um, I'd be able to tell from that. Caramel is a really nice variety. This is pretty much a standard. Everybody knows caramel. It's got those really nice fall shades to the leaves. It's got those sort of fallish colors. Caramel is a really old hybrid. It's a French hybrid. It was developed in France back in the 1970s. Nobody for years knew what the breeding was. Unfortunately, when you deal with a lot of the European breeders, they don't keep accurate records of what they're doing as far as hybridizing. So you'll see a really nice plant and ask about the breeding and usually you get from them, the, the response you get from them is, eh, but it looks cool, doesn't it? So that's one of the problems you run into when you're dealing with some of these plants out of Europe. Caramel is a really nice one. It's got that nice velosa to it. Really good colors and it's pretty reliable. I have a lot of landscapers that are using this one and they swear by it because it is a really good tough plant. Later on into the season, the leaves really start to develop and you get those nice big flushes of leaves and you still have that nice flush of variable color to it. But it is a really good one and it is a reliable one. It has been around, like I say, for about 50 years. It's just a really good tough plant. Cherry Cola is a really nice one out of Terra Nova. 
Uh, this is a really good red. To get the most intense red on this plant, a little bit more sunlight. So about half a day of sunlight is going to give you a really nice bright red. And it's got those really nice red flowers on it that you get from the sanguinea breeding in it as well. So it's going to have a really nice red, red cast to it. The leaves start really bright red in the spring and then fade to a more dull red through the season but you still have those red flowers being freely produced on this plant throughout the season. Purples and blacks are very common colors. The reds, oranges, yellows, those seem to be the most popular colors right now because they're so different and there are so many nice new varieties coming out. Cherry truffle is part of the Dolce, Dolce series in Proven Winners. The dulces have large leaves, but the plants are a little bit, they're not quite as big as the primos. The primos are enormous. The dulces are a little bit smaller than that. They're bigger than an average variety, but they're not quite as big as the primos. But this particular one, cherry truffles, has this really nice red, and it holds that red through the season. So it will keep that nice shiny red foliage pretty late into the season. Citronelle, now we're talking about the lime greens. There are, like I said, some of, this is one of the most popular colors in coral bells, but they're not the most reliable. The biggest problem you have is the siding for this plant, where you're actually going to grow it. In this lime green, there have been several out. One of the first ones that came out was Lime Ricky, and Lime Ricky was a dud. Uh, you could barely get it to last, last one season. But this particular one, cherry coal or citronelle, is a nice one. This is a sport off of caramel. So it has that velosa breeding in it. So this is actually one that was derived from caramel out of that French breeding program. So it has the lime green to it. To get this good color on this plant, you need morning sun, afternoon shade. I'm gonna say probably about two to three hours of sunlight to keep really good color. If you put it in pure shade, it's gonna to go to more of a green, but to, get, but to get that really nice lime color, a couple of hours of sunlight in the morning. If you go to afternoon shade, you're gonna fry that foliage. It's gonna turn, start turning brown and you're gonna have some color discoloration to it. It starts to lose, you can see in this slide, a lot of that color. It's gone to a real almost yellow color, and then you see where the leaves start to actually lose, the color leaches out completely. They turn white, and then they start to brown out. So if you're getting these lime colors into too much sun, that's going to be a problem. You're gonna notice that a lot of damage on those plants. It's not gonna be fatal to the plant, but it will cause that damage. Good drainage, Adequate moisture for this is a must. When you see these plants die out through the winter months, it's not because it was too cold. It's usually because there was a drainage issue where the water, the soil stayed too saturated or held too much moisture, or possibly the plant went through a dry condition through the fall and caused root damage where the plant was not able to survive all the way through the winter. The Yellows, these lime greens, are one of the most challenging ones of the coral bells to be able to grow. Electra is a really nice velosa hybrid. This particular one has this nice venation to the leaf. It has sort of a lime green color to it through the growing season. And as the season progresses, that red vein get, becomes more prominent. This is what velosa does in the winter months outstanding fall color and winter color. You have those nice reds, yellows, greens, all at the same time. All of the hookahs are evergreen, so they will have foliage there through the winter. But this particular one just has really outstanding fall and winter color. It again is the Velosa hybrid, so it's got those nice large leaves to it. Outstanding plant for in mixed containers. Probably my favorite out of the reds would have to be Fire Alarm. Fire Alarm is an outstanding red and it's got nice flowers to it. The flowers are a real pale pink, all close to white, but not quite. But the foliage on it is really nice, really large, very glossy. 
It holds that red really nice late into the season. I have a garden store and greenhouse down in Lexington, Kentucky. They, one of their big businesses in the fall is they provide plants and do a lot of container gardens for horse farms during horse sale season. And of course, with the horse farms, they each one has their own separate farm colors. Anytime that they have containers that they're using red for, this is their go-to plant because it holds that really nice bright red color and holds it all the way through into December, January, before you even notice any damage. These will hold up really nicely through a uh, frost or a light freeze. So you have that really good red color on it all the time. Having been in the gardening business for a long time, I cannot stand places that give you false advertisement in color. When they show a picture in a catalog or in a magazine or even on the internet of a plant that's got sky blue color and then when you actually grow it it's like a weird lavender shade or they'll show it as fluorescent pink and it's actually a dull pink this particular plant is called forever purple and that picture that you're seeing there is true to color it is really purple purple almost to the point where it's difficult to work in a landscape design because that color is so intense, but it is a really nice one for in mixed containers. This particular one was bred for the hot and cold climates in our region, so it will handle really hot summers and cold winters. It has a nice leaf to it, neat leaf size, but it does have that outstanding purple color. So this one is a really nice one. This is Forever Purple out of Terra Nova. One of the very first of the hybrid hookeras to come out was Frosted Violet. This particular plant was bred by Primrose Path Nursery up in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia Lancaster area. Uh, Charles and Elizabeth Oliver, they were some of the pioneers in hookera breeding. They were some of the first ones to start using our native hookeras to breed these nice new varieties. Frosted Violet is one of the toughest that you're going to find. If you can't grow Frosted Violet, I suggest you probably give it up because this is just a really tough plant. It's an outstanding variety. It has upright foliage to it. The flowers are some of the largest that I've ever seen. Uh, they, it is not uncommon for these flowers to grow three to four feet tall. I usually cut them off because they just get too big and the flowers are really nothing to write home about. They're not that spectacular. I know in production last year, the flowers just about hit five feet tall. Didn't know you could use coral bells for screening or for privacy, but I guess you probably could for this one because it gets so big. The flowers though are not the biggest attribute. The foliage is really nice on it. So I recommend this one highly because it is just a really good, tough, adaptable plant. Sun or shade, wet or dry. It's just a really good, remarkable variety. Georgia peach is a really good one out of Terra Nova. This one has colors that change throughout the season. This has got a lot of the uh, Velosa breeding in it, but it has those really nice unusual peach colors with that sort of a fuchsia color on the underside of the leaf. Gives you really nice texture and color. The leaves start off, of course, with that peach color, and then as they mature, they go to more of a green color that you can see here in this inset, but it's a really nice plant. Really good large leaves to it. The you do have some openness to the plant, so you, it is one that works really nicely in mixed containers because you can get other plants around it very easily and it doesn't outcompete. But Georgia peach just has outstanding color with that sort of a fallish shade. Grape expectations out of uh, Walter's Gardens. This is a, a Velosa and Sanguinea hybrid, so it does have both parentage in it. It has the nice shiny foliage to it with that sort of a purple cast with a little bit of a silver overlay, which is really nice. 
Um, you do see over time the leaves go from that really shiny to a dull matte sort of a look, but you still have those nice color changes on it throughout the season on a nice mounding plant. This one can handle sun and shade, uh, a little bit of both. So on your darker colors, you can still get by with them a little bit more into the sun. They're a little bit more forgiving in a sunny area. Lime ruffles, another one in that lime green. This is a good one. It's out of that color. This is one that performs really nicely. It has those nice ruffled leaves to it. Again, morning sun, afternoon shade on these lime colors because they will fry if they are getting too much sun. Lime ruffles does produce a white flower. The flower is nice on it. It's a nice full flower. Unfortunately, it doesn't show up really nicely against that lime green. So you can either let them flower and leave them alone or take the flowers off either way. But it's just, the flower is good, but it doesn't show up really nicely against that lime green foliage. Gigi, how are we doing on questions? We good? We're good. We're going to hold questions to the end and then uh, we'll catch them at that time. Okay. Palace Purple. This one's been around forever and this is another one that a lot of the landscapers are going to. Palace Purple is a Micrantha hybrid. So it has that uh, Idaho, Washington, Oregon breeding in it where it's growing in very tough, rugged conditions. It starts off with those sort of chocolate colors there to the upper right, and then matures to more of a purplish color through the season, and then finally ends up with that darker color. The flowers are very open, very light. I usually cut the flowers off on this one. The, this plant was released back in the late 1980s. This was the Perennial Plant Association Perennial of the Year in 1991. This was the second Perennial of the Year ever. So it has been around for a long time. A lot of the landscapers still know it and it's just a great performer and still a tough one to beat. In the Primo series, back to the proven winners, this is Mahogany Monster and it is a monster. The leaves on that can be up to four to five inches wide, quite big. It's a really nice large plant. So being part of that Primo series, it does have that substance to it. This is what it looks like with Black Pearl. So you have the two of them, really nice big plants, big bold foliage that are gonna perform really nicely. With the Primos, I do recommend them in the ground as opposed to in containers. Since the Primo varieties and Proven Winners do get big, they will outcompete a lot of plants in mixed containers unless you're using a really big container. So I do recommend being careful with the Primos when you're using them in mixed containers. Mega Caramel, this is the same as Caramel. This is a sport off of regular Caramel, but it is a larger growing variety. So it's sort of like the Primos, but it is not part of the Proven Winter series. It does have that large Velosa foliage to it, but it doesn't get quite, um, it does grow bigger than the regular variety. It, it grows quite about the same size as the Primos, but it does have that nice mixture of colors of reds browns, greens throughout the season. Midnight Bayou. This is one out of Terra Nova. This is one that was bred especially in the south, but it does work really well around here. Midnight Bayou was bred for hot, humid tolerance through the summer months. It's got a lot of velosa in it, so it does have our native breeding in there, but it will hold up in these hot, tough climates in this area and does performs very nicely with that nice purple. The purple flattens out through the summer. Um, it goes to a more of a dull color through the growing season. So it doesn't hold that intense purple all the way through the season, but you still have a nice color with that nice venation to the leaf. Midnight Rose is an outstanding variety. Midnight Rose is a sport of obsidian, which we'll be taking a look at in just a moment. It has that nice variegation to it of dark purple with pink or rose variegation to it. It's speckled throughout the plant. Sometimes you'll see an entire leaf come out with that 
sort of um, rose color. Sometimes leaves will come out half and half. Sometimes they'll be splashed like this. The variegation on obsidian hold, or midnight rose holds up pretty well. A lot of these variegated varieties sometimes will revert. You will get reversion sometimes when we're talking about reverting, we're talking about where it goes back to what it used to be. It may go back to all black, but this particular one does hold that variegation pretty well, pretty reliably. And the later on into the growing season, the color does mute, so it doesn't have that as intense of a show as it does in the spring, but you still have some of that variegation on there. This is obsidian. This is the parent of Midnight Rose. It has that dark leaf to it, almost a rounded leaf. Uh, has a lot of that velosa shape to it. So it, do, it does have that lobed texture, but it's not quite as pointy on the leaves. With obsidian, it is almost pure black. I do recommend this one in mixed containers. If you're looking for that really dark color, this is one that's going to hold up really nicely and it will work with other plants very well, as opposed to black pearl that can outcompete a lot of plants with it. So if you're looking for dark colors in mixed containers, obsidian is still a good one. Late in the season, when you get into October, November, it starts to take on more of this chocolate sort of a look where it goes into more of the purples and browns. So you will lose that black late into the season, but it still gives you a really nice color effect. Peach flambe is a really good variety. This one has this nice uh, bright sort of uh, peachy red color tones to it. It's a really good one. It's a cylindrica hybrid, so it has that really nice uh, shiny leaf texture to it, and it does have some decent flowers. It holds really nicely through the season. In the spring, you have a really good flush of colors to it. Later on in the season, those colors become a little more muted, but it still gives you a really nice effect. Another great one for in mixed containers. With these reds and pinks and peaches, they can they're a little bit more sun, uh, sun tolerant. They can handle a little bit more than the limes. So you can get these in three or four hours of sunlight. A little bit of hot afternoon sun will be okay. They're not gonna burn out as easily. So you can get, they have a little bit more wide range as far as what they're tolerant of. Plum pudding. This is an Americana and Velosa hybrid. This one is a landscaper staple too. I have a landscaper in Indianapolis that orders these by the ton because he uses them in just about every job he does. It's a good dark variety. It holds the shape. It holds the form. It can handle really dry conditions. It can go pretty wet through the winter months and it holds up really nicely. So this is one that he does highly recommend and I recommend too. We've been growing it for years and it does work really nicely. Um, it's just a really good, durable, rugged plant. Silver Scrolls. This is another one out of Primrose Path out of Pennsylvania. This was one of their hybrids. In fact, when I went to see them, they had just released this plant about 25 years ago. It has smaller leaves to it with that silvery overlay, but look at the underside of the leaf with that purple. It's just outstanding. Really good color to this plant. It almost reminds me of a hybrid begonia because of the way that the leaves lie and the way that it grows. It's a reliable evergreen. It's been around for years with that silvery overlay, morning sh sun, afternoon shade. If you get it in too much sun, it's gonna scorch on you. So having this sited in the right spot is pretty critical, but this is a really good, tough variety. Snow Angel. This is a variegated form. It's green and white. This is the last year you're going to see Snow Angel on the market, unfortunately. Um, this particular one is a variegated variety, but it does revert. It will go to solid green. I don't think that it reverts any more than any others, but the grower on this particular one has discontinued this plant, unfortunately, because of that green and white variegation being so unstable. It does produce really nice red flowers that you can see there. So you have that combination of red, white, and green at the same time. 
the white on the foliage does lose out or does shade over later on into the season. It becomes less white. It goes to more of a light green. So it does lose that color over time as the plants mature. There are some other green and whites out on the market in the city series. For example, Paris is one that is a nice green and white. So that one you may be seeing people using a lot more of since Snow Angel will be disappearing. It is, Snow Angel does have a lot of that sanguinea breeding in it because of those flowers. Those flower scapes on there are really nice, bright red, not extremely tall, but it is one that I do recommend for the flower effect. Southern Comfort. This is another one that was developed for the South for those really hot humid growing conditions that they have down there. When you get a lot of humidity, you wind up getting a lot of disease problems. So this is another one that was developed for that. It is a Velosa hybrid. It grows very similar to caramel. So it does have that really large effect to it. It is a larger growing variety. So I do recommend having giving it a little bit more room, similar to the Proven Winter Primos. It just needs some size to be able to get, some room to get some size to it. But the color on it is outstanding. Starts with these sort of peaches, reds in the spring, and then they mature to these greens, yellows, and reds later on into the season. The flower is nothing to really speak of. It's a really tall flower. I usually cut them off just to get rid of them because they just kind of junk the plant up so it doesn't give it as nice or clean of an appearance. Spearmint is a really nice new one in the Dulce series by Proven Winners. Once again, this is a medium-sized hookra. It's got a lot of the Americana breeding in it. Uh, the flower color is outstanding. It's a nice rose pink and those flowers are produced on that throughout the season. So it does give you a good flower effect long through the summer. This is what I'm talking about with those silver overlays, those plants that have the silver cast to them. This is what they do when they're in too much sun. They get these scorching, the scorching on them, this uh, almost tarnished look. So you do want to be careful with your siding on those. If with the silver overlay, it will fry if it's in too much sun. So that's what they look like when they are starting to scorch. And eventually those leaves will just turn brown because they're getting too much sun. So you do want to look at that effect when you're siding this plant or taking a look at how much sun it's going to be getting. Sugar plum. This is an Americana Velosa hybrid. This is a really nice purple as well. Not quite as big as some of the other varieties, but it is a little bit bigger than Silver Scrolls and it doesn't have as much of a silver to it. It's more of a purpley silver, but it has a really nice purple effect late into the season. It does lose that silvery sheen later on as the plant matures. Small flowers that are sort of a peachish color. So it does have, it doesn't produce an abundance of flowers, but it is a really good one for that foliage effect. And finally, Wild Rose. Wild Rose is a really nice purple. This is in the Proven Winter series. It's a purple that you can work into a landscape. It's a medium purple and it's got really nice flowers on it. The spikes grow to about 10 to 12 inches tall on a nice full plant with that purplish cast. It has those pink flowers to it, but it does have a, a purple cast to it, but not an outlandish purple. Places for you to look and information that is out there. I highly recommend getting onto the Mount Cuba Center uh, website in Hawkinson, Delaware. Mount Cuba is a private botanical gardens. They do a lot of research. Hookahs are one of their specialties. And I have to tell you, this is that college professor that you had who at the beginning of the course told you, there's no way you're gonna get an A in my class because at the Mount Cuba Center, there's not a coral bell alive that they give a really good, really good remarks to. They're gonna find every problem that you could ever have with coral bells. So it's a really good resource for that. Terra Nova, 
in Oregon as a breeder has really good information. When you Google these names of these plants, they will tell you a lot of the information. They also go into a lot of their breeding programs and where they're getting their plants from. Walters Gardens up in Michigan also has good information that they publish on their website as far as what their plants are doing and what to expect. Proven Winners is a really good marketing company. They're going to give you the really good information about their plants, not a lot of negativity because it is a marketing uh, organization. So they do have good information on their site as well. At this point, we can start taking some questions, Gigi. Okay, so uh, one of the questions was what varieties on slide 38, and I believe somebody answered it. It was called Berry Timeless. Okay. And yep. then the next question is, if you grow in container, how do you protect in the winter? If you're growing them in containers, and how do you protect them through the winter? I did an experiment probably about 10 years ago where over at our landscape office, our landscape design office, they have a pot and I put some coral bells in there and left them out through the winter months. And that particular year, we were hovering around zero through the winter months. And those plants did remarkably well. They survived through the winter. So keeping them moist and not letting them dry out is the key because if they go dry and those roots, roots freeze solid, that's usually what kills them out. But otherwise, if you're wanting to protect the plants and keep them in good shape. Now, the year that I did that experiment, these weren't enormous, beautiful, showy plants the next year. They had really shrunk from going through that. So my biggest recommendation would be to take any of your mixed pots into an unheated garage or a shed, a place that's gonna be warmer than outside, but a place where they can still go, it's gonna be cool enough for them to go dormant. So that's gonna protect them. Otherwise, if they freeze solid for pro prolonged times, those leaves and those roots and those stems, they're not gonna be able to move water around and it can kill the plants out. Okay, uh, somebody else had a question on slide 43, but it was answered black taffeta for anybody else that would wants to document that. Um, just a comment that in the future, it would help to have the common name. I know you did provide a handout and it had the mm -hmm. scientific name on it, mm -hmm. um, but somebody asked for the common name to go along with it. Mm -hmm. um, are there plants that are good for cut flowers and vases? Leaves in particular, please. These are great as far as the cut foliage. A lot of these varieties, especially when you're dealing with the Primo series and some of these larger growing varieties, the petioles on the plant, the leaf stem are really long, so you can actually use these as cut plants. Um, the flowers on Berry Timeless and some of these other varieties that are nice and tall will work really good as cut flowers, and they hold up pretty well. Snow Angel holds up really good as a cut flower. So this is a really good plant for both the cut flower and the cut leaf. There's a lot you can do with them. Uh, which varieties are most sun tolerant? The most sun tolerant varieties would be the blacks, the dark purples, uh, some of the reds. When you're getting into the lighter colors, they're gonna need a little bit more shade to protect them from that. So you can't go wrong with dark colors in sun. Caramel can handle a fair amount of sun for uh, that sort of uh, fallish color. I would say no more than four or five hours of sun. If you get beyond that, you might wind up winding, having some scorching on there. Are there any varieties that are foliage only, no flowers? No. Unfortunately, that's just the nature of the beast. That's what they do. It's kind of like with hostas. Hostas are a foliage plant. Everybody always thinks of those as foliage. They produce the flowers, but there are some varieties that produce nice flowers. There are some that just aren't that great. So you can remove the flowers as they're coming out. It's not gonna harm the plant at all. The flowers are just a reproductive feature, so they don't need that to survive. You can cut those flowers off as they're developing. What other plants do you recommend for containers with coral bells? Virtually anything. That's the beauty of 
container gardens, it's all about experimentation. Hookeras are probably one of my number one go-to plants for in mixed containers as a perennial, but there are all kinds of annuals that you can go in there with. Um, right now, for example, a lot of people are using pansies and violas and things. When you go in with pansies, pansies and violas and go in with some of these colors like forever purple, that really bright purple, that's going to look great. You can even go in with uh, some of the dark colors like black pearl. Black pearl looks great with yellows that you would get in pansies or even pinks. So feel free to experiment. There's a lot of plants that are going to be, going to be able to grow in that same sort of a condition. With containers, you're e it's easy to manipulate the water in those. So you're going to have good drainage in there and you're going to be able to control that in a mixed container more than you are in, a in the ground. But the sky's the limit as far as experimentation. Okay, hey, um, I think you've already answered this question is how does removing the flower affect the plant quality for the next year? It does not affect the quality at all. Um, just getting rid of those flowers is just that. You're just taking the flowers off. The flowers, they do not need those for anything. Um, they, in some cases, some plants actually benefit from removing flowers because the flowers are a reproductive feature of that plant when they're trying to set seed. In the case of hookeras, they don't produce seed. Most of these are sterile varieties, so they're never going to produce seed, but that flower takes energy out of the plant. Gigi and I both grew up on farms, and that's one of the things you do with tobacco. When you're growing tobacco, you're growing it for the leaf. Get rid of that flower on that plant, because if you leave the flower on there, your leaves are going to be small, and it's going to shrink the plant. Um, it's amazing, because I've always had friends that always grow tobacco, and they always want to grow it for the flowers. Like, flower. The leaves always look so much better without it. But it is going to be a benefit in some cases to removing the flower. In this case, it is, because when you're, the plant's trying to put that energy towards creating seeds, having kids, it's going to take a lot out of, of energy out of that plant. And then there's a question in regards to splitting the plants and the optimum appearance. Okay, as far as splitting, we were talking about that. The, the best time to do that is in the spring months. I would say any time from now till probably early June is when we start getting really hot and dry. So right now is an excellent time to split to do splitting on those you don't want to split them too small a lot of people like to make as many of these little pieces of the plant as possible so they'll have as many as they can get and hand them out to everybody they know if you get your cuttings too small you're going to hit, reduce the size of that plant and the vigor of that new plant that you're creating. So don't go too small. I usually like to do, when you see those stems on there, they look like little fingers. I usually like to keep three fingers together when I'm dividing these. You don't want to go too small on your divisions because otherwise it's going to take forever for that plant to recover if it ever does. And we've already covered the, will the plant survive the winter if left in the pot? And you mm -hmm. described that earlier. Um, how much fertilizer do Haruka like Haruka's like, when and how often should fertilizer be applied? With fertilizer on hookeras and on all of your perennials, once a year. We recommend uh, a good fertilizer that's out there on the market is Osmocote. It's a granular fertilizer. You sprinkle it along the surface of the plant in a container or in the ground and water it in and it very slowly releases throughout the season. You, with perennials in general, they don't like a lot of food. So hitting them once a year is usually optimum for them. It's gonna create that growth and it, with Osmocote, it very slowly releases. So it's gonna stay in that soil for a long time. Okay, do the hybrids reseed? Not all of them. Most all of them do not reseed. If you do get reseeding action, they usually don't come up true to seed. That is true with a lot of hybrid plants. Um, one that comes to mind are uh, columbines. If you have a red columbine and it comes up from seed, it may come up, come up blue, it may come up white, it may come up as something else. So with a lot of hybrid plants, they do not always come up from seed. In the case of hookeras, they don't always come up from seed anyway. 
Okay, has anyone rated these plants for popularity with pollinators or hummingbirds? They have not rated them as far as best or worst, but I can tell you right now with any of the newer varieties where you're seeing the good flowers, these are the types of flowers that they like on Berry Timeless, on Snow Angel, on the ones that have those nice tall spikes. Hummingbirds love those because they have that long sort of a bell-shaped tube-shaped flower. So they're the only ones that are able to get to the uh, nectar in those, but they do make a really good pollen, pollinator plant. Okay, so the next question might be, um, it depends because of our current times, but are any of these facilities open for tour or sale? I think that refers back to your resources. On the resources that I had, if you, you can go up to um, Mount Cuba, and I highly recommend it if you've got the time, the national capital for horticulture in the United States is Philadelphia. And there is so much stuff to see up there. Uh, Longwood Gardens, of course, is there. There are numerous private gardens there. In um, Mount Cuba is in northern Delaware, so it's almost a suburb of Philadelphia. There's also Mount Cuba is open to the public uh, April through October, so you can actually go through there and view the collections. There's also right up in that area is Chanticleer, which is also a public garden, as well as the Winterthur collection. So there are a lot of places up there that you can see. With the plant breeders up in Michigan, they do, they are not all open to the public. There are um, trial, trial gardens that they have that they open up in the summer months. It's called, there is a tour called the Michigan Gardener's Tour, Michigan Growers Tour. Um, you can Google that and find information on that. You do have to register for that, but there are several gardens or several breeders and growers up in that area that do actually open for that, but it is in June. I'm not sure if they're gonna be having that this year. I don't know what their feelings are. For the most part with gardening and horticulture it all does take place outside so uh, there aren't a lot of restrictions on that um, as far as terra nova out on the west coast i know that they are not open to the public okay um, where is the handout with names that was sent in an email um, along with the presentation link and the link to get on the zoom so if you Somehow it did not come through on your email. Let me know and I will get that to you. Uh, Chicago Botanical Gardens has many plant trials for climates like your or like ours. Um, fertilizer amounts. I don't remember if you said that when you were talking about Osmocote. I did recommend Osmocote and it will tell you on the label clearly on there how much to use for the size of the plant. I believe it goes they have like a little scooper in the container and it says so much per inch of plant. So it does have that clearly listed on the label for you. One other place that I do recommend here uh, locally that does a lot of trials, Ohio State up at their, comp their campus up in Columbus, they always do trials and they have really nice trial gardens that you can actually go through there. So it's right up next to the Chadwick Arboretum. They do have really nice show gardens there too, so you can actually view a lot of these plants. But they are trialing a lot of the new plants up there. Uh, one that we talked about earlier was Fire Alarm. That red uh, coral bell, that was one that Ohio State uh, gave their best, it won the award for the best uh, shade plant back in 2012 because it performed really nicely for them. And they do put these plants through through the rigors to get them to see what's gonna live and what's not. They do it with annuals, they do it with perennials, they also do a lot of trials with shrubs as well. So Ohio State does is a really good resource for that. Uh, sometimes the plant will lift out of the soil during the winter. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they do lift that out of the ground in the winter months. With perennials, I usually recommend trying to get them in as early as possible. I don't like to plant perennials past October 15th 
because that way the plant's gonna stay down in the ground. It does not hurt a perennial if you go out and step on it from time to time through the winter months to mash it back, back down into the ground. Planting them in the spring and through the summer months is good because you're gonna get a good root system on them. If you wait too late into the season, those roots can heave and free, the ground will lift them up out of the ground as it freezes and thaws. But stepping on those and mashing them back down into the ground, you can do that anytime, even through the winter months. Do you sell most of the harukas mentioned here or do you uh, go directly to the grower? We have just about everything on this list. So that's one of the things you can, you can find these at Natorps or just about any garden store here in the greater Cincinnati area, throughout Ohio, throughout the Midwest. These are all readily available varieties. Oh, here's a great one. How are they with Japanese beetles? No problems with Japanese beetles. As far as insect problems on here, the only problem that we ever have is an insect called flea beetle. And with flea beetles, you only see them usually in a growing condition. Um, it's a plant or an insect that likes to be in, go after plants in containers on a nursery. Rarely do I ever see that in a garden set, setting, but they eat little holes in the leaves. But Japanese beetles, I've really never seen any damage on them from them. Well, it looks like that's it, unless somebody else has a question. Uh, we have lots of comments. It says good information. Thank you. Fantastic. Wonderful presentation. All right. So, um, my harukas were apparently nibbled by deer, but are the plant but are the plants not attracted to deer? It's not a deer's favorite. They'll go after it if there's nothing left. There's a lot of plants out there that, Ron Wilson, who does a lot of gardening talks here in Cincinnati, he and I talk about this. There are no deer proof plants. In my opinion, there are a couple of them that are out there. Um, aconite, for example, winter aconite. Um, it's toxic, so if a deer eats it, it's gonna kill it. But hookahs are not toxic. They don't like the texture of the leaf. They will chew on them if they get desperate enough. If there's nothing left, they will chew on them and cause some damage to them. There are some different repellents you might try. Um, there's a lot of different ones out on the market. You just have to be timely with them. You have to reapply them whenever it rains. With repellents, I've heard people swear by them. I've heard people swear at them. So. It's just being timely with them and making sure that they, you're putting them on at the right time. Okay, Are there any other questions? I think everybody is uh, jumping out, but thank you, Pat. Um, thank you. I keep wanting to call you Kyle because that's what's on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for everything and uh, being part of our virtual perennial school. Um, it seems to be going well last week and this week. We got one more week. Uh, so please make sure that you are registered by 8 a.m. on next Friday morning and I will get you that link sent out. Otherwise, everyone, please have a great weekend, a safe time with your or remaining stay at home and stay healthy. Thank you, Pat. Now I'll let you get back to back to your real job. I know I got to go to Louisville now. Oh. <laughs> yeah.